Hi, welcome to part 2 of my review featuring the Wicked Ones role-playing game. If you haven't seen part 1, please check out the playlist in the description below. This is a role-playing game featuring those monsters that dwell within those dark dungeons, those adventure sites. We are talking about kobolds, orcs, wraiths, zombies, gnolls. You can play as any of those creatures. In this part, we are going to take a look at the basics of the role-playing game. How you make different roles, how the game is structured, and so forth. We immediately have information on how to get started with the game. In this role-playing game, you play as monsters working together to build a dungeon and wreak havoc on the region around it. The dungeon is the main character of the story. Your monsters are going to be dying, of course, but you just need to create a new monster, or promote one of the existing minions. The dungeon is your home and refuge. It is a safe place for you to lay your head after some raiding, a structure that will protect you, but you will also have to defend the dungeon as well. The dungeon will grow over time, as you fill it with all sorts of traps, monsters and crazy stories concerning your interactions with the heroes of the tale. Remember, you are playing as the monsters, as the villains, the classic fantasy villains. And navigating your dungeon will truly be a difficult challenge for any group of adventurers, because you're going to be filling this place with traps, tricks, locks, magical rituals. This role-playing game is divided by phases and scenes. You follow a cycle of play based on lurking, building up your dungeon to deal with any calamity or unforeseen consequence. But then you also carry out raids, you have to leave the dungeon and attack targets on the surface world, and you deal with any blowbacks that such attacks cause. A lot can happen within each phase, and for the most part, time passes in a fluid way. When things hit up and the action gets interesting, you zoom into what is called a scene. Within scenes, time slows down and events progress in sequential order. You can still skip forward when nothing interesting is happening, but time is mostly driven forward by player action. When the starting situation in a scene isn't exactly clear, you use engagement to clarify it. When the excitement wraps up, you zoom back out into the more fluid flow of time again. This zooming in and out happens naturally through play and doesn't always have to be clearly stated. When you zoom in to a scene, the player starting the scene or the game master sets the scene up, detailing where the characters are and describing what's happening in the situation. You then zoom in and take the roles of the characters. Other players can decide to jump into the scene and they will earn experience points for doing so. You use scenes to flesh out the story and establish elements of the fiction. Sometimes a brief description and then using a game mechanic allows you to add some detail to the story without playing out the entire scene. But when you do zoom in, it gives you the chance to make that scene an important part of the story. In this role-playing game, there is a strong emphasis in that you can't access game mechanics before giving at least some level of description. Even a simple one-line explanation will suffice. You do this because every detail you can add into the fictional world helps make it more interesting. And even after that, if you can't find mechanics that match up with what's happening with the scene, the game collapses neatly down into a single fortune roll. You can always fall back on this when you are not sure what to do or can't recall a particular rule. You just make a fortune roll and you describe what happens and you move on. We will talk more about these sort of roles later on. Now when it comes to play structure, the game works well as a one shot, as a short length campaign or a longer campaign. An ideal campaign of Wicked Ones covers about 16 sessions, which is 4 months of weekly 3-5 to five hour sessions. You can expect a dungeon invasion about every 3rd or 4th session, and your dungeon to increase in tier at the same rate. As your dungeon approaches tier 4, you get closer to realizing your master plan and the region around the dungeon becomes more likely to unite against you. Throughout these sessions, your player characters and minions act as your primary role-playing tools. Minions are groups of monsters who live in your dungeon for pay. They are like secondary player characters, 
like henchmen or hirelings for player characters in other more heroic role-playing games. And the more you make them a part of the story, the larger your dungeon will feel. Each wicked one has control of enough horde to recruit a pack of minions, though this doesn't mean the minions are blindly loyal to their masters. When it comes to the flow of information, from the game master to the players about the fictional world, it is very important to have a sort of feedback or a constant uh, back and forth between game master and players. While the game master and players work together to establish the sandbox and factions within it, the world mostly resides in the mind of the game master. So the game master has two responsibilities. He or she needs to share information about the setting with the players and describe what a character perceives, suspects or intuits. Unfortunately, there is too much going on to tell the players everything. It would take forever and the game would be quite boring. So when information is lacking, it's up to the players to ask for what they want to know. And to make things a bit more smooth, you can act on any knowledge that you have, even if your character doesn't know it. It's all about building fun stories and making sense or coming up with an intelligent excuse as to why your character is acting in a certain way related to information outside of the character's role. In this role-playing game, it is also encouraged that the players also become authors. There is a lot of room for authorship on the part of the players. They ask questions, they start to establish things about the setting and the game master decides if that information is true or not, or just maybe or to a certain degree. You could also make a fortune roll to determine if something is true or false. Now with all of this freedom of information, it is also important to note that there's also hidden information. Scouting the surface is incredibly dangerous for monsters and if caught, the monster is not going to make it back to the dungeon, probably. If you don't have the proper training, which is a calling ability, we'll talk more about abilities later on, your lack of understanding of how civilization works means it's unlikely that you learn more than common knowledge. So even when you see something, it's difficult to put it into context and make use of that information. You spend most of your time lurking behind your dungeon defenses, making it tough to learn about the surface. You have to rely on the following methods to get your hands on hidden information. You either torture prisoners, you contact factions or vile friends, you pay gold for information, maybe you carry out some raids with the purpose on obtaining some info or data, you could use calling abilities or dungeon rooms, which allows you to establish facts within a limited scope, or maybe you resort to flashbacks, providing some background related information. When you successfully use one of the methods described, you gain some hidden information, and it is revealed by asking questions, establishing facts, or maybe the game master wants to reveal some secrets. Now let's talk about stress. As a wicked one, you are unique among monster kind. You have an extra reserve of tenacity called stress that you can tap into to exert your will. You fend off disastrous circumstances or suppress the dark impulses that lurk inside of you. You can spend stress to make use of several different game mechanics, allowing you to do various impressive feats otherwise not possible. You can spend stress on calling abilities, flashbacks, resistance rolls, teaming up and using some magic items and suppressing dark impulses and you clear stress by rolling a critical on a resistance roll or meeting certain criteria within an ability. Stress is represented on your character sheet by a six segment clock. When something requires you to spend stress, you fill in one segment of the clock. Resistances are the exception, however, with the amount of stress you spend ranging from one to three, depending on the results of the resistance roll. When you clear stress, you erase one segment on the clock and when you run out of stress and tick the last segment, you go feral and lose yourself to your dark impulse. However, stress is recovered in full during recovery at the beginning of the lurking phase. Now let's talk about dice. Anytime there is uncertainty within the story, you roll dice to figure out what happens. All rolls are made using six-sided dice and you'll need four to six of them. Anytime a die roll is mentioned, it is written with the number of dice to be rolled first, followed by a D. So a 3D means you need to roll three six-sided dice. Some abilities or situations might modify how many dice you get to roll. 
A plus or a minus sign means you need to add or subtract from the pool, such as plus 1D or minus 1D. When figuring out how many dice are in the pool, you first apply negative modifiers with a minimum pool of 0D, then apply positive modifiers. When you have no dice to roll, you instead roll two dice and take the lower result. While there are various types of rolls in the game, almost all rolls follow the same basic pattern. There are four roll results, failure, mixed, success and critical. You gather a pool of dice, roll it and keep the highest single die result. This result is used to determine how well the roll went. A critical happens when you roll two or more sixes on one roll. A 0D roll, however, discards the highest result and never results in a critical. Now the result is judged as follows. You obtain perhaps a failure, this means a no and. You get a mixed result of yes but, a success is a simple yes, and a critical is a yes and. So you are going to be getting additional effects for these results. So maybe you fail at a particular task and something even worse happens as well. Or maybe you accomplish a task but something unexpected happens that complicates the situation. Or maybe you succeed at something and maybe you obtain some sort of benefit to go along with it. Every action role covers both the player's action and the action of non-player characters as well. For the most part, players are the ones rolling dice. When a player rolls a mixed or a failure, the game master responds with the world acting against the player characters, so expect to see a lot of mixed results. You do have a categorization of types of roles, however. You have player roles, which are action roles made to do something challenging. You have resistance roles made to resist consequences. And you have loot roles, which are made to pull gold and items out of the loot you raided for and you enjoy revelry, gaining dark hearts. We will talk more about that later on. Game master roles are divided in engagement roles, made to determine how a raid starts off or how ready the player characters are when we zoom into a scene. You also have calamity roles, which are made to determine if anything bad happens within your dungeon while lurking. This sometimes triggers dungeon invasions. You also have blowback roles. These are made to determine how the world responds to raids, sometimes triggering dungeon invasions. You also have fortune rolls, which are made to answer questions about the world when the game master isn't sure or doesn't want to decide on his or her own. You also have defensive move rolls. These are made to see if an antagonist can resist a player character action. One thing is true for all dice rolls. They never result in nothing happens. Now, when it comes to actions, they are different methods and approaches that you use to get things done. They represent a character's natural ability and training and show what you're good at and what you're terrible at. They basically define how your character goes about solving problems. You have a list of actions that covers the most common ways in which a monster deals with his or her own problems, though there could be some difficulty applying an action to every situation. To help with this, each action has a descriptive adverb tied to it, which expands on how it is typically used. Now, actions are broken up into three categories called attributes, which are a good indication of how the actions within it are typically used. Sometimes attributes are hit with a consequence called shock, weakening that set of actions temporarily. So you have brains covering actions such as scan, tinker and trick, you have muscles covering actions such as fitness, skulk and smash, and you have guts covering the actions of banter, invoke and threaten. You need to think about what your character is doing, describe it, and work backwards from that to choose an action. Don't think about the action first, it will limit your creativity. If you can't find the one that fits, you look to its associated adverb to broaden its definition. Matching description with actions is key, because it determines the sort of success or failure that you can obtain. So the player chooses the action rolled which tells the game master and the table how they want to approach the task. While calling out actions to be rolled is a common habit for game masters to fall into, you should fight this urge, because it's the player's job to tell the game master how they want to approach doing something, and it's the game master's job to determine how effective or risky it might be given the situation. This is called position and effect. 
We will talk more about that later on. And to facilitate the understanding of using actions, you have plenty of examples on how to choose the action that fits the situation. Let's talk about action roles. When you attempt to do something challenging in a situation with risk and tension, you make an action role to see how it turns out. Action roles are a risk made in tense situations with something on the line. As an action is narrated after the role, the game master and player collaborate to describe what happens on screen. An action role has two functions. It tells you what the player character is trying to do, but it also determines the actions of non-player characters and the world, as the player characters are acting within that world and with those non-player characters. To fully understand the stakes in play and what might happen, each action role has four parts that are detailed prior to the role. Intention, action, position and effect. So, as mentioned earlier in the review, you have action roles that can result in failure, a mixed result, a success or a critical effect. And when it comes to the action role process, the player first details his or her intention, the player chooses an action, the game master gives the OK to the role or modifies position and effect, and the player rolls or chooses another approach. The role's effect determines how well you accomplish the intention, and the role's position determines how bad the consequences are on a mix or a failure. Consequences complicate the situation as non-player characters and world move against you. Action roles are assumed to have a chance at achieving what we'd expect as normal results for the chosen action, but they also carry the risk of something that complicates the situation. However, when circumstances are outside the norm, the game master can modify the position and effect of the role. Depending on the situation, you might end up in a dominant or dire position, or with a strong or weak effect. It's the player's responsibility to narrate their character's success. It's the game master's responsibility to narrate for non-player characters, judge results and hand out consequences. In this way, players and game masters narrate the results of action roles together. Now, when it comes to the scope of the roles, action roles resolve several things happening within the fiction at the same time. It covers the setup of the action, its execution, and the fallout as well as anything else that might be taking place on screen while that happens. The world moves every time an action role is made. The scope of what you can accomplish is determined by your intention, the chosen actions and the difficulty of anything in your way. Most things that take place in the game occur due to action roles and getting the narration for this right makes the system and fiction flow smoothly. On a success, the focus is solely on the player characters. On a critical, the player characters completely steal the show. However, when you obtain a mixed result, things become a bit more dynamic. The focus might start on the player character, as you describe your action and in the end you do manage to accomplish it. However, things don't go as well as you hoped or as planned and it's the game master's job to steal the limelight and pull the camera away from the player character and hand out consequences. When it comes to narrating a failure, things go poorly. The focus might start on the player character with you narrating how your action starts or where it goes wrong, but the game master soon takes control and describes how the world makes you suffer some consequences. Now, scenes are where the action happens and time passes in them sequentially, with actions or game master narration pushing it forward. Thinking about this like a movie makes it easy to imagine. If enough time has passed or there's a dramatic cliffhanger or lull in the action, it's probably time to pass the torch and allow other player characters to step into the spotlight. There is no set turn order, however you do take initiative grabbing the spotlight and declaring an action. Another player passes the spotlight, the game master points the camera at you, and the game master keeps the camera on you depending on the situation. So it's all about being quite active and reactive, determining who's next depending on the flow of the story, and inflicting consequences on the part of the game master, especially when the player character's dark impulse overrides their indecision. There is no preset turn order, as you can see. It's a freeform system and everyone is going to participate in this collective narration as different consequences and effects happen dynamically. 
And of course, if there is any doubt or dispute as to how things proceed, who goes first and such, you can always roll for it. Let's talk about position and effect. Position is a measure of how severe the consequences will be if you fail an action roll, and effect is the measure of how much impact you will have. Only action rolls have position and effect. Most action rolls are made with the player characters on equal footing with the challenge at hand, as you choose an appropriate action and have the right tools for the job. When circumstances are working for or against the player characters in some way, the game master can modify the position and effect of a roll. You have some examples here on how you may end up in a dominant or dire position, or with a strong or default effect. Before each action roll, the game master considers the circumstances surrounding the situation. The easiest way to frame this is trying to figure out if a player character is on equal footing, has the upper hand, or is in a tight spot given the situation. And when a circumstance is clearly more important than others, it's considered an overwhelming circumstance, and it outweighs other factors. So as you can see, the rules truly support the narration the roleplay on the part of the player characters and the game master. The game master can assign these positions to better represent the risk of an action. A dominant position is when you're clearly in control of the situation and don't expect much immediate backlash. A dire position is when you're clearly out of control of the situation. Should you fail, you can expect the worst. When it comes to deadly positions, they are assigned when death is on the line, like doing something incredibly dangerous like jumping over lava or a chasm, risking bodily harm and such, when you already have blooded as a condition. The game master can assign effects to better represent the impact of an action. For example, strong effect means you clearly have a lot going in your favor and expect things to go very well. Weak effect means you clearly have things working against you and doubt you'll have much impact. And zero effect is assigned when even if you roll a success, nothing productive will happen, such as trying to attack a huge enemy with a small pebble, or trying to convince a non-player character that you come in peace, when you actually just stab that non-player character. And when it comes to assessing circumstances, you need to consider the action being used, the scale of each side, the quality of the equipment being used, the skill of the opponent, defenses and resistances, the strength of the magic in use, environmental factors, and more specific situations. All of this is going to reflect or have an impact in the narration, in the description of the fiction. Now, when it comes to engagement, anytime the circumstances in a scene are unclear, the game master rolls engagement to set the stage and figure out how things begin. Engagement tells you how well prepared you are for what's to come, setting up the initial circumstances towards position and effect. So depending on the role, Maybe you start in a tight spot, on equal footing, having the upper hand, or maybe there is a lucky turn of events. This also has to do with positive factors, which might include knowledge beforehand of an attack, receiving help from someone else, but there could be negative factors, such as outside forces that are hindering your progress, having wrong or incorrect information, and environmental factors that hinder your task or your actions. And this concludes the review for today. In the next part, we are going to talk about consequences, more about dark impulses, dark bargains, adjusting roles, handling flashbacks, many other things. So as you can see so far, this system truly supports the fiction, the uh, description and narration of the player characters and the game master. The rules are there to support roleplay and handle any effects or situations that result from various roles. So thank you for watching this review and thank you so much to those of you that have been supporting the channel by sending drive through RPG gift certificates. If anyone else wants to further support the channel, the information on how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you and see you later.